Greetings, I'm Shad, and I love coats of arms, though technically, strictly speaking, that is an incorrect term, but I use it because that will then identify and let you know what I'm going to be talking about, because they're awesome! Don't you think I just look cool, they got dragons and lions and other things on them? But what I particularly love about the uh, conventionally speaking coat of arms is uh, how it the symbolism in it, how it identifies the individual to whom it belongs to. I just really love that kind of imagery. Also, you know, that through visual means you can then, you know, tell something about this individual person. It adds an element of coolness to the individual depending on what they have in their coat of arms. You know, if they've got a cool dragon or other, the thing that represents me is a dragon or a lion or a sword or a boar or a stag or any number of things, it's just awesome. It says something about the individual, but it also lets the individual convey what they want to be conveyed to other people. Now, remember how I said that, strictly speaking, the term coat of arms is actually incorrect, and it is. Uh, coat of arms is actually referring to a coat, an actual garment, though it has evolved to mean the full armorial achievement or heraldic achievement. That is actually the official name of what you think of when you hear coat of arms. It's the armorial achievement or heraldic achievement. And it is not a crest or family crest, which is, uh, you know, a term or a descriptive phrase that people use to identify the armorial achievement. It's not that at all. Armorial achievements have crests in them, okay, but they are not crests as a whole. That, that's a, an incorrect thing. Also, just to point out, I will be using my own armorial achievement that I've designed for visual reference throughout this video. Now, it's not official, okay, I, I could make it official if I really wanted to, but it follows most of the rules of heraldry when describing what is on a full coat of arms and other things like that, and so it's a good point of reference that I can show and also manipulate to you know, emphasize the parts I'm talking about. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's step back and establish where the concept of a coat of arms originates. And that is, of course, the problem with knowing who friend or foe is on the battlefield. Because when you're fighting everything like that, you don't want to kill Joe and realize, well, oh, he was on our side. Sorry, Joe. You all right? Yeah, yeah. I guess not having a head is going to be a bit, you know, difficult there. So there needs to be a means to identify who is who on the battlefield, especially if those peoples are important. Now you might think that could be counterproductive. If you're an important person and you put, you know, have this big, you know, symbol that represents and lets people know who you are, that might just paint a target on your head. Well, not really. In fact, it often saved your life more often than it would ever kill it, because if you're an important person, that meant money. And so if someone saw, oh, that's so-and-so, he's really important and he's really rich. Well, I'm not going to kill him because if I capture him, that means I can hold him for ransom for his rich family and they can pay me for his release and then I'm get lots of money, don't I? And so the practice of ransom was actually a very common thing in the medieval period. But still, we're going back to the beginning. Let's, so let's go back again to where this, you know, this need for identifying people on the battlefield originated. That originated for as long as battles ever been around. Sometimes it wasn't difficult because, oh, they're wearing this type of armor or this type of culture, you know, and so we are wearing Roman armor with bright reds and we've got also banners which help identify us, but if we're fighting the barbaric, you know, Celts or Goths or other people like that, you know, it's not as difficult. But if we're fighting people who are generally wearing the same type of armor that we are wearing and look generally the same, then it can be kind of difficult. So the first examples of heraldry, uh, and this is kind of, it's called proto-heraldry here because it is before official heraldry was established, but the first types of proto-heraldry we find is in the markings on shields by the Normans, and we see this in the Bayo Tapestry. And if you're familiar with the early medieval period, you will have seen many of these shield designs. Sometimes it is a division of colors, sometimes it's a basic cross, sometimes it's a circle, so it can be any number of things. Uh, but this was a means to help identify who was who in the battlefield. Well then, of course, that practice was continued. And because these symbols were on the arms, specifically the shield, arms meaning armaments, weapons, okay, and specifically the shield, there are, these symbols were on the shields, 
they were called arms as well. Oh, those are the identifying arms of that person. And do you see where the you know crossover kind of happens? Because they weren't really identifying the symbol, they were identifying the armaments that they were wearing, but that is so-and-so's armaments because it has that symbol on it, and that is Joe Blow's armaments because it has a different symbol on it, and those are their arms. And that is also technically the correct term for it as well. You can call it the armorial achievement, but you could also just call it someone's arms, just like they would have done in back in the day, and that's still very accurate. You can see that that is so-and-so's personal arms. Well, from their origin, these symbols and identifying markings started to uh, move from the shield. They still were on shields, but they started to appear in other things, specifically on the garments that these warriors, now knights, were wearing. And so they would bear their personal mark, their device, on their surcoats, and also later on, then their tabards. And so then we have the term the coat of arms, because now our coats, our garments, are bearing the markings we originally put on our armament, sorry, our armaments. And so now we have the term coat of arms. This is my coat bearing the markings I have on my arms, coat of arms. And that is why the term coat of arms is strictly speaking incorrect, because you're actually referring to the coat that knights and also later heralds would wear that bore all the markings that identified who was who. So that is the origin of where the armorial achievement comes from. Now, the thing that to uh, understand about the armorial achievement, and look, there's no harm in still calling it a coat of arms. You can still do that because it's what the common terminology is nowadays. So what you need to understand about the coat of arms is the most important parts on it is what is on the shield and also the crest. What is the crest? Because this is a term that people get very confused. They think a crest identifies the main device or charge that is on the shield. The official term for the symbols that are on the shields is actually a charge, and there can be more than one, but a charge is a symbol, and it can be an animal, it can be an object or whatever, that uh, has some type of connection or relevance to the individual, and hence why they picked it. That is not a crest, though oftentimes the crest was identical to the primary charge on the shield. Huh? That, that does sound kind of confusing. Well, let's clear up some of these terms, okay? And using proper heraldic terminology, it would be called the escutcheon? Estuchen? Can you see why I don't use that? <laughs> You can just call it a shield and everyone understands what you're saying here. The symbols or markings that are presented on the shield in a classic coat of arms has often been identified as e charges, that's the official term. The, the actual individual symbols, they're, they're called charges, but they've also been referred to as crests, as uh, devices, and lastly as sigils. Now out of those terms, the official terms are charge and crest, but crest refers to something else in the coat of arms, in the full armorial achievement. And so you'll never actually have a crest on a shield, though you will find devices, okay, and that's another term, device and charge can often be used interchangeably, which is the main symbol on a shield. You often find devices that are identical to someone's crest, and sometimes they're completely different. And sigil is an unofficial one, okay? I've never found it specifically referenced in any official heraldic description, okay? But it's kind of evolved, and it works quite well. And if people know, understand what you're saying, you could use sigil. Now, sigil then would not refer to a crest. It would be referring to what is on the shield. So then, what is the crest? The crest, hence where the word comes from, refers to something on top of something. And so the crest of a mountain, or you crested a hill, okay? And so in regards to heraldry, it's referring to what is on top of a helmet. You see, remember the most, the two most important things in a full coat of arms is what is on the shield and what is the crest. So then what's on the shield and what the crest is. Why? Because those are the two things that the knight would wear. Now the crest is only sometimes, because you would only have a crest, well where crest really came to play in regards to medieval Europe and knights and such is in the tournament scene. And what they would often have, they'll have these uh, fancy big kind of statues things on top of their helmets. And that was on the crest of the helmet, hence it was called the Knight's Crest. And a practice arose in the tourneys around me in the medieval times to try and knock off the crest of an opponent's or opposing knight's helmet. In reality, crests are quite impractical because they add more weight to a helmet and so it'd be extremely rare that a knight would ever 
have a helmet with a full crest if he was going into serious battle. They primarily served a function for the tournaments, not actual medieval warfare. In medieval warfare, it was the coats of arms that you would wear that served the function. And so because of that, some of the first crests were actually direct duplicates of the primary device that a knight had in his arms, his armorial achievement. And that's a common practice. You can find many, many coats of arms, all right, in where their crests are either a copy or a duplicate of something that is on the shield. In the cases where crests are different, that would often be to identify a certain type of achievement that an individual did to uh, something important that uh, gained them prominence or renown, or it could have been the very thing that awarded them right to officially have a coat of arms. Now, in my opinion, the most important thing in an individual's arms is the primary charge or device that is on the shield. That is the biggest thing that is uh, identifying you as an individual. Now, this, with that in mind, you can understand why it got, might have uh, become a bit more complex later on in history, because when certain families would marry, it was common to combine people's uh, arms, what is presented on the shield primarily, their full device, together. They might split it down the middle or even quarter it and then put them kind of together. Now, an armorial achievement always identifies an individual person. You will never ever have two armorial achievements that are identical to one another that represented two different people. No, they were, th they were there to represent individuals, not families. And so when you had someone who uh, married or something, and then you would have the he when developing his own coat of arms to mine things from the two families that would identify him and he would be the only one who would have this full type of combination well in those cases he will have multiple charges on his shield and there is no longer a specific individual symbol that represents him as an individual person and so when that happens that's when the crest kind of serves the original role of what the, that individual symbol should have been now oftentimes it will be an element or a charge that is on the shield duplicated in the crest but it's one of them with there's multiple but sometimes it can be completely different and that crest then would identify that individual person so in that regard i see more of a purpose in the need of a crest in a full armorial achievement but when you have a primary you know device charge on a shield that is not combined with anything else it's just a single one there is actually no real need for a crest in your own armorial achievement if you ever decide to make one so in regards to my coat of arms there's actually less need for a crest in it than if uh, I had multiple charges on the shield. If I did, well then yes, having a crest to identify what is my primary kind of device that I want to represent me, that's when a crest would be more uh, appropriate. And of course, if I was a knight in medieval times, you know, going into tourneys and jousting and other things like that, and I wanted a crest on my helm or to have a crested helm, well, then I would use my primary symbol that identifies me, which is my main device, which is on my shield. And then my crest would then become by default the same as what is on my shield, because that is what I'm using on my helm. And if that was the case, this is what my crest would look like. It would be a 3D representation of my primary device because that's what it would look like on my helmet. But even though I have less need for a crest, I still have picked one that is different to my primary device, and that is a book. But you'll also notice I uh, duplicate themes that are on my shield on the book's cover, which again is a common practice. You will find many historical coats of arms in which their crests have either the same design as the primary device on the shield or is at least duplicating or has some elements of that primary device in the elements of the crest. So how did one get an armorial achievement? Well, that varied uh, between country to country. In some countries, it was more difficult. In some countries, it was far more easy. And in those countries where it was easier, you didn't have to be of noble blood. If you performed a, a special or a significant act for society or had a unique achievement, you could uh, petition for a coat of arms and be given one, even in like the 1400s. But in other countries, you had to be of noble bath to get one. Now, I've mentioned before that an armorial achievement represents an individual person. Let, let, I'm going to explain that because this is something that is often misunderstood in regards to the subject of 
coats of arms, and that is the thought of, but this is my family crest, or it's a family coat of arms that is passed down. First of all, a coat of arms represents an individual person, period, okay? They never represented whole families. They could be passed on to a, a descendant, but not the whole, all of the, a person's children. It would only be the firstborn male who could inherit a, a coat of arms. And even in those cases, if, say, I inherited my father's coat of arms, I would have to change something on it to identify that it is me who has this coat of arms and not my father. But because a coat of arms did become hereditary in that sense, that's kind of where the concept of this is my family arms or my family coat of arms comes from. What I do need to say here is that it was common for certain families to adopt a specific type of charge or device that was then used throughout really any member of their family who could have a coat of arms, and whether they were male or female, to identify that yes, I am part of this family, but the whole armorial achievement wouldn't be the same. They would just have a specific device within their shield that was the same that identified their family. And that could be anything from an apple to an object like a goblet or an arrow or a sword, or it could be a lion, or indeed three lions on top of one another, and that's one you will see very often repeated in the British royal line. And because these devices were also often used as the crest of these individual coats of arms, the term family crest kind of appears now. It's not referring to a family coat of arms that every individual family member had a right to, but it was referring to a device that was used by most family members to identify membership of a family line. And so you could have devices that were the same as devices that other people had within their own armorial achievement. Crests seems to have been more regulated. But the main rule was that the whole coat of arms had to be different or distinct in some way from anyone else's. So say your family device was a lion, and you as a member of that family were expected to use the lion as your primary device, or at least a smaller device or charge on the shield. To do that, there would have to be something different on your shield as a result. A different field that the device sat upon, different colour, maybe a stripe or a line of colour through the field that was different to someone else's. Maybe the lion would have a crown or a helmet atop its head. It could be holding an object such as a sword or a goblet or anything like that, just something different that made it distinct. The thing is, officially, even if you find an ancestor that had an official coat of arms, you have no right to claim it and say this is then for yours because you're their descendant. That isn't how it works. Unofficially, there's nothing wrong for you saying, well, this, you know, was my ancestors, I would like to use it to represent myself. You would have no official right or legal right to do so, but there's really no harm in it, okay? Uh, if you wanted something more official that identified who you were, well, then you would need to make your own. If you do decide to make one, it wouldn't be official unless you're a member of the British realm. And I'm Australian, so I actually could if I wanted to. I just need 10,000 Australian dollars to register it. <laughs> My goodness. If you're not a member of the British realm, well, getting an official coat of arms, you can't have it be included in, you know, the full standing official coat of arms that still exists today and are used for individual people, though there is a very close um, modern comparison or equivalent to medieval coat of arms, and that is trademarks. Trademarks essentially fulfill the exact same purpose, and so if you're not a member of the British realm and you want an official coat of arms to be regarded officially in society, you can make one up and then trademark it. It would cost you a bit of money, all right, and if you don't use it in any official, you know, things, it, they usually will, uh, uh, expire or be withdrawn. But what that really means, if someone else wanted to use the exact same trademark and you haven't been using it, they can then try and file for their own trademark and uh, kind of take away yours. And then you'll need to renew it every 10 years. That's for Australia. Don't know what it's like for you. But that is the modern equivalent to essentially what the medieval coat of arms were kind of like. But again, Finding an ancestor who had an official coat of arms does not mean that is your family's coat of arms at all. 
completely not the case. And so those websites that uh, show, type in your family name here and we will show you your family crest or which, and look, if they ever say, we'll show you your family crest in referring to the whole coat of arms, that's a clear sign that this website is absolute bull crap because it's an incorrect term. They don't even know what they're talking about there. And then if they try and present to you a full coat of arms saying, this is your family, you know, armorial achievement, no, it's not. If you were a direct line descendant, okay, and there was no one else who had a more direct descendant line than you, you could actually petition to try and inherit it. Very rare. Good luck at finding, you know, proving that as well. My goodness, yeah, it's rare. But it could be done. And if that was the case, if you were a direct line descendant, you could petition to inherit it, and dependent on how strict the country is where it's evolved, because there are some countries that just don't even care. Yeah, you use it for whatever you want, it's not official anymore. But for say, in the British realm, from what I've read, you would still have to change at least one thing on it to identify it as you being the one using this coat of arms than your ancestor. Personally, I like the feel of just making a brand new one that identifies you as an individual, who you are. I had such fun designing my own armorial achievement because I went deep into heavy symbolism and this thing really represents and tells a story of who I am and what I value in life. And if you are interested in the symbolisms behind my own personal coat of arms, and again, it's not official, but I can still say this is my coat of arms that I made to represent me. Okay, and because I've published it on the Evening Art, I also have copyright over it. But anyway, if you want to know the symbolisms behind it, I will be making a video on it. Uh, you can watch at your leisure, and I hope you will enjoy it. So I've talked about the main symbol or device that is on the shield, and that can be more than one depending on the individual. I generally like a you know a singular primary device on the shield to identify an individual person. Now, those are kind of, those are my favourite designs. Now, on top of this device, well, sorry, not on top, real, I should say, behind the device is the field, okay? Now the field can be a single color or it can have divisions be put into multiple colors. Now these divisions can serve purposes sometimes. That is if you have multiple devices in the shield. Well, generally then, the shield will be divided to create a space for each individual charge or device that's on it. Other than that, having divisions on the field can just be for aesthetic purposes to dress it up, make it look a bit nicer. But because the colors have individual meanings in terms of heraldry, and officially the colours are called tinctures, okay, using old language, but each individual colour does have a, an official meaning in heraldry, and so if you wanted to convey a meaning through colours, you would then have certain divisions on your own, on the field of your shield. And that's exactly what I have done for the field on my own shield in my own coat of arms as well. What you need to understand though is that in many cases in the past, the primary device was actually a division of colors in and of itself. And that would be someone's primary charge identifying symbol for themselves in their coat of arms. And you've probably seen many as well. Like for instance, having a four-way quartered shield with two colors opposing one another, or having a cut, you know, split down the middle of two different colors, a line above the top or a cross, or there's any number, a chevron, okay? There's any number of shield divisions. Now, these divisions can serve, like I said, as a, a full device, okay, representing an individual person, or they could be for the background, the field, having a symbol in front of it. You might have noticed that I haven't talked about the other elements in the coat of arms yet, such as the mantling, which is the drapery that kind of sits behind it, also the helmet, the there's the shield supporters, the motto, all these other things. The reason why I haven't focused on them yet is because they're far less important. Indeed, you can have a full-fledged coat of arms, like absolutely official, that is just the shield and the primary device and field. That's everything that's in the shield, and that's it. You don't need anything else. That can be your coat of arms, because that is the primary thing that a knight would have worn on his surcoat or on his shield or tabard. Everything else is an embellishment and is not required to fulfill the function that a coat of arms was meant to serve. Now, of course, these embellishments uh, like, can serve functions in certain uh, symbolic things, identifying this or that, also presenting the prestige and wealth of the individual. But the primary purpose of a coat of arms can be achieved just by the shield. And in fact, that is the central, most important part of it, with a sub kind of, you know, category of the crest, 
if a crest is more needed, and I've talked about the circumstances where it would be. Now, having said that, there are some, you know, embellishments that are, I find to be more significant than others. For instance, the motto. Now, the motto can either be underneath the shield or it can be above the shield. It varies. But I really like that element. I like you know, having, because uh, it says something about the individual, and this is all the purpose of what a coat of arms is. And so a motto, therefore, in my opinion, adds a really important and significant element to it. So I love it. So I think, you know, um, uh, you should always try and have a motto with your coat of arms. They're not. Next, let's look at the helmet, because the helmet does serve a purpose in identifying the status of the person whom this coat of arms belongs to. And so if the helmet is open face, so it has an opening and has bars over the top, that generally is reserved for people of significant social standings, particularly royalty. And then extension to that, people who own lands and other things like that. Uh, a closed face helm represents someone who is not a higher up noble, just like a, a landless knight or something like that. And so because I am not an official noble, I of course have a closed faced tilting helmet that it was used in, you know, the jousting tournaments in my own coat of arms. But the helmet is not at all necessary, especially if you're not royalty or a significant higher up noble, you don't need a helmet because that was really there for to identify your, your status, your position. And so if you just don't have one, that also identifies you as not someone who's higher up in the noble hierarchy. And so my own coat of arms achieves the exact same thing without the helmet as with. I have the helmet on it just mainly because because of tradition, if I want if I want the full armorial achievement and to show the classic what is a coat of arms when someone thinks coat of arms, I have it in there just so if I wanted the full blown shebang, this is my armorial achievement. And the supporters are even more of an embellishment because they don't represent rank or position or anything like that. They're mainly there for, like I said, for embellishment, but also in the extension that sometimes they're there to represent the country to which the person comes from. And so it might be a native animal or something like that. And of course you notice that in the Australian coat of arms, but it has an emu and a kangaroo. But again, they're not necessary and they're primarily an embellishment, but they still, they, I, I can see why they were added because they, everything helps frame the shield to present it as a very prominent, important thing. So it just looks awesome. I can see why people added supporters to a coat of arms, uh, again, makes it look cool. This is the same with the mantling as well, and most of the other embellishments, okay? They're just to make the coat of arms look better and to kind of present and frame the most important part, which is the shield itself. But I should really rephrase that and say, uh, the things that are on the shield, because it didn't always have to be a shield, especially if you're a woman. A shield is more of a masculine thing, and so men would have shields, but a woman, they, she, they would generally have like an oval or a, uh, a diamond, but not a perfectly symmetrical diamond like it's a square that's been turned on, it's a thinner diamond on the sides. Now, as complex as all this ha might have appeared to be, it's only scratching the surface. There is a lot of sophistication and details that go right into it, like the exact type of colors, and again, they're called tinctures, so the exact type of tincture that's on the shield. What it means if there's more than one helmet, or more, and it's sometimes even more than one crest. What about when there is multiple different coats of arms within the main shield itself to represent, you know, marriage and unity from past people and other things like that? because there are some crazy ones that have a huge amount of, uh, you know, devices, full devices, previous coats of arms combined together. And then there are the specific rules about what is allowed and what isn't. In some cases, and this did depend on countries, certain colors weren't allowed to be um, combined together. And that can vary on w in which ways they're used. Like for instance, the mantling. I've heard in some cases you could only have a color that represents a metal and a regular color combined together, but you couldn't have two normal colors. In my coat of arms, I have two normal colors, red and blue in the mantling. And so there might be, a, I think there is a circumstance where that would not be allowed. Then there is regulations on the type of charges that can be used. For instance, the eagle is generally a more regulated symbol on coats of arms because it's a, specifically a symbol of sovereignty. And there's more. So as complex as this might have appeared to have been, th it's the basics <laughs> that I've shared with you. But it's awesome because even the basics have this uh, beautiful level of sophistication behind it. Thank you for watching. I do hope you have enjoyed. And you might also like my video where I explain the symbolisms behind my own personal coat of arms. Until then, farewell. 
If you would like to support Shadowversity or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.